is the Happy Scientist Podcast. Each episode is designed to make you more focused, more productive, and more satisfied in the lab. You can find us online at bitesizebio.com slash happy scientist. Your hosts are Kenneth Vogt, founder of the executive coaching firm Vera Claritas, and Dr. Nick Oswald, PhD, bioscientist, and founder of Bite Size Bio. Hello and welcome to the Happy Scientist podcast from Bite Size Bio. If you want to become a happier, healthier and more productive scientist, you are in the right place. I am Nick Oswald, the founder of BitesizeBio.com and with me is the driving force of this podcast, Mr. Kenneth Fote. I've worked with Ken for over seven years now with him as my business mentor and colleague and I knew that his expertise could help you in the lab. In these sessions, we'll hear mostly from Ken on principles that will help shape you for a happier and more successful career. And along the way, I'll pitch in with points from my personal experience as a scientist and from working with Ken. Today, we will be talking about the multitasking myth. But before we get onto that, remember that in episodes one to nine of this podcast, we talk about the foundational principles of human needs, core mindsets, and charisma factors. So if you find this episode useful, please go back and listen to episodes one to nine to get an understanding of these life-changing concepts. So let's bring in the man himself. Kenneth, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Cool. Well, let's, let's dive right into, first off, what is multitasking? Before we have much to say about it, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, well, it, it's rather simple. Multitasking is dealing with more than one task at the same time. Now, that doesn't mean that you're that if you do multiple things today, you've been multitasking. It means if you're trying to do them at the same time, if you're riding your unicycle and juggling, that's multitasking. <laughs> and as you can imagine, just from that little that little uh, example, it's kind of hard. And in fact, from the title, you might might also assume that we're not too positive about it because the multitasking myth. Because the fact is many people think multitasking is their answer to productivity. And furthermore, many people think they're really good at it. And so, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you've heard, heard other, uh, you know, other fellow lab mates bragging about how they can do so many things at the same time. And we're not, I, I'm gonna say right from the beginning, we're not saying it's impossible to multitask. That's not the point. Yes, you can ride a unicycle cycle and juggle at the same time. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. It certainly can be done. But the problem is, is it's coming at a cost. And I'm not just going to offer up my opinion for that or, or anecdotal evidence. I'm actually going to cite two university studies. Now, we're going to talk about one of them in a fair amount of detail, and the other one we'll, we'll mention. But I'll, we'll have links to both of them in the show notes, so... If you really want to dig in and you want to you want to read the research, you'll see it. Now, the, the first study we're going to talk about came from Stanford University, which uh, I believe everybody will accept is is pretty a pretty sound academic institution. You know, they've got 18 independent labs, centers, and institutes. They have 109 research centers, and if you've ever been there, it's an amazing place. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about one study from one of their centers. It was, uh, it was entitled Cognitive Control in Media Multitaskers. And there were, there were three authors. I believe the lead author was, was uh, Dr. Nass. And then, and then he had two other, two other qualified folks with him. But you can, you can uh, take a look at that if you want to look up the study itself, which we've linked to. But... When you think about Stanford University, Stanford has also launched many a startup. Productivity is a big, big deal to the Stanford crowd. So for them to come out with a study that just skewers multitasking, that's pretty important because they're seeking what is the most productive way for things to be done in business and in research. And well, <laughs> <laughs> this kind of gives you an idea where we're headed with all this. And I have to say, a lot of the study, 
Um, I'm with you, Nick. There, earlier in my life, I really thought I was a great multitasker. It wasn't just that I thought that multitasking was good, because I didn't think it was good for everybody. I didn't think everybody could do it. But I knew there were some special few, like myself, <laughs> who could excel. Yeah, it certainly seemed like it was the thing to do, didn't it? Yeah. And, and it, at any time, it was just a matter of uh, I wanted to be active at all times. I didn't want to have any wasted time. If I could do two things at once, why wouldn't I? Because the fact is, we do two things at once, or more than two things at once, all the time. You know, when you're driving a car, your foot is pushing a pedal, your hands are, are turning a wheel, your eyes are scanning the road. So you know, we know that multiple things can be done at the same time. Or, you know, if you look at more broadly, I uh, say, well, at any given moment, hey, my heart is pumping, my lungs are breathing. I don't, I don't have any problem doing that, and everybody does that. So isn't that multitasking? I would say, no, not, it's not multitasking, because um, what we're talking about here are tasks. Tasks that are being consciously performed. And for instance, your heartbeat, that's not being consciously performed. It's not even being subconsciously performed. That is being autonomically performed. And breathing is the same story. Although you can overrule it, at least for a while, I can make myself hold my breath or I can make myself breathe faster. But at some point, the automatic system is going to take over and go, oh, no, you have to breathe again. Or you are hyperventilating. I'm going to make you pass out until your breathing regulates. <laughs> and unless you're some very accomplished yogi, you probably can't control your heartbeat rate. <laughs> now, the thing is, we can do things subconsciously, though, that will control some things. So, for instance, if you get anxious, you might stop breathing. You might hold your breath or, or, or your heartbeat might raise or your blood pressure may increase. But, but you are not directly doing those things. What your subconscious is doing is creating anxiety and then the body is responding to anxiety with its, its program for what do I do when, when anxiety kicks in. Um, so, you know, we, got, we want to differentiate between conscious things we do, subconscious things that we do, and then bodily functions, because they're not the same. And, and oftentimes I'll hear people crashing together the, the word mind and the word brain, and it's not the same thing. Brain is, a, brain is an implement. <laughs> A mind is something that has to do with, with psychology. You know, that's, that's your subconscious and, and conscious mind. Um, but they're not the same as your brain. Your brain is having some kind of f function that is reacting to what our, what our minds are doing. Uh, so there's a little bit of difference here. So, but we're going to be pretty much focused on conscious stuff here. This is, this is conscious mind endeavor. This is, these are the things you're choosing to do and choosing to do at the same time. And, and we'll see what happens here. When this, this study looked at three, three key abilities, filtering, memory management, and task management. So, um, and so what, it turns out that while many people have problems with one or more of these abilities, chronic multitaskers are actually bad at all three. The people that think they're good at it are bad at all three. <laughs> Let that sink in for a while. <laughs> the better you think you are at this, the worse you are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> worse you and, at these things anyway. Yeah, on these. And being bad at all three, it's not just that. You might be, okay, I'm bad at all three, but I'm just slightly bad at all three. I'm not that bad. I mean, average people that are only bad at one are worse. No. No. Chronic multitaskers are, generally speaking, worse than the average person for each of them individually also. I mean, it, this, this, poor, this study is so brutal. I, I'm telling you folks, it's, it's hard to hear if, if you are a committed multitasker. <laughs> so, for instance, somebody who's a multitasker thinks that they can concentrate on multiple things at the same time. But actually what's happening is that you're easily distracted. You'd assume that this habitual multitasker would be able, to, uh, you know, would really be excellent at filtering out the noise, when because they're focused on their 
chosen multiple streams of, of input. But the, the problem is, is they're often not choosing them. They are letting the, their environment choose them. And so the more inputs they get, the more they just leave the gate open and let those inputs come rolling in. And it turns out that, that multitaskers are, are easy prey for, you know, red and shiny syndrome. <laughs> that if there's something distracting, it gets their attention. They, they don't block it off. And even if it's irrelevant, they still go for it. They don't prioritize it. They don't, they don't um, decide whether or not it's important. They only act on urgent. So it's there, it must need attention, and that's where, they, that's where their mind goes. And the, the problem is that, that you've probably all heard of a, a, a grid that will help you decide what to do. It's a, just a, a simple two by two grid. And that is something's important, something's not important. And then on the other, you know, put that on the X axis and on the Y axis, it's urgent or it's not urgent. And so you can have a task that's both not urgent and not important. Wow, never do that. <laughs> you should never do that task. It's not urgent or important. You could have a task that is urgent, but not important. That one is compelling because we just love urgency. But it, the fact that it's not important tells us maybe I shouldn't really be giving this attention right now, even though it's urgent. It's, you know, it's the the three-year-old yanking on mama's skirt when she's cooking dinner. What's important right now is that she not, you know, dump a pot of noodles on the kid's head. And and the three-year-old wants to inform mom that the dog has entered the kitchen. You know, so what, <laughs> right? Uh, it's not important. But it's urgent because, you know, here's this yanking on the skirt. Well, then you have things that are important but not urgent. Wow. Those are the things that we love to put off. Those are the things that we stall on. <laughs> that, yeah, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Um, but they're, they're one of the best things to do. And then finally, there's things that are urgent and important. Well, that's, that's obvious. You know, you, you fell off the roof and, and you broke your arm. This is not urgent and important that you get medical care. So <laughs> we jump to those things. But the chronic multitasker loves urgent doesn't care about important. And, I, and again, I know you're fighting this in your own head, but I do. I care about important. Yes, but you're still being pathed by urgent. And so you will do things that are urgent, but not important over things that are important, but not urgent. That's, that's one of, the, one of the, the flaws of the chronic multitasker. Any of this sound familiar, Nick? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it definitely sounds familiar to me. I'm just trying to figure out how to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> so, so you mean that uh, because the the flip side would be if you weren't multitasking, you would be taking, selecting one, you know, the ideal priority task and then just focusing on that until it's done rather than allowing it to crowd in with all sorts of things that are yes. not the priority. Okay. Urgency would not take priority over the task you were engaged in. Okay. Imp only importance would. So, I mean, I, I will grant you, if you're doing something and you're, you're, and I'm gonna, I've invented a word, monotasking. If you're monotasking this and you're running an experiment and everything's fine, and then somebody, somebody just wants to chat you up right then, it's like, excuse me, I, I, I'll get to you in, in a half hour. You don't, you don't react to that. The fire alarm goes off in the building. Okay, you react to that, even though you're in the middle of your experiment, because that's important. Um, so there's that's how you how you manage the difference of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's monotasking. I like that. I think we should make the "I'm a monotasker" T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the beauty of that is monotaskers they are focused. Focused people see things, and. The, and unfocused people miss things. People who are distracted miss things. And so, in fact, we'll get to that in a little bit. Well, it really is back to, back to the tortoise and the hare, really. Mm -hmm. here, isn't it? it seems like it'll be faster to do lots of things at once, but actually the focus you can put into each task if you're monotasking is, mm -hmm. gets you the speed in the end. Yeah. Right, and the second study I'll comment on later will, 
will skewer that one really bad. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but let's move to the second part of this study. The next thing is multitaskers, uh, they don't use memory very well, which is interesting. So do you think that a high, you know, a high multitasker would be methodical and organized because they have to hold so much stuff in their head at the same time? So they would be good at memory, but actually they're not. <laughs> What, what ends up happening is they get overwhelmed by data. They get too much going on. Now, now I realize that the, among, among scientists and among, you know, the, uh, among intelligent people even, many, many people in, in this group are good at holding a lot of information in their head, but everybody's got a limit. And so when you're trying, what, what, what ends up happening is you don't have the chance to properly compartmentalize this information. Now, uh, and that becomes very important when it comes to accomplishing uh, complicated tasks, individual complicated tasks. You've gotta be able to tell what is information and what is noise. And I know there's a, there's a bit of a, you know, a popular meme about how men are better at compartmentalizing and women Hold, hold things in mass and you know I, I'm not going to get into get into that that particular hornet's nest right here but the fact is, is that there's a certain amount of compartmentalization that's needed to, to get your jobs done just as there's a certain amount of crossover needed between compartments to get your job done those are all fine but the fact is that the multitasking individual the high multitasking individual does a worse job at compartment compartmentalizing memory does a worse job at accessing that memory so they're slower to recall information so when they need it it's not necessarily there um, or at least it's not there on time so so is this study suggesting that that people multitask because they're bad at these things then um no that that's the other thing that is kind of interesting about it it, it seems like it is it is an acquired <laughs> I can't, I can't call it skill. It's an acquired deficiency. <laughs> it messes you up. Okay. Yeah, it makes you worse at things. So the fact is, some of this stuff, you, you, know, you may look at those things at the beginning that we talked about, filtering, memory management, and task switching. You think, yeah, I'm really good at those things, or at least I used to be. Uh, <laughs> Until I multitask. Yeah, you're actually hurting yourself by multitasking. And maybe you can stave off um, you know, some of the, the negative impact but it's coming at a cost. And you never know where that cost is gonna show up. It could show up in energy, it could show up in health, it could show up in, in efficiency, it could show up in um, how well you do the job. It's interesting actually, because the, the, the sort of outcome of these, or, or the consequence rather, of these um, deficiencies then, would be things like overwhelm, procrastination, all the sorts of things that People, you know, and feeling harassed, feeling like you never get to the end of your to-do list. All the things right. that a lot of people to, in modern day describe their job as being, or their situation as being. Right. Well, modern society is, to a certain extent, demanded multitasking of people. They've described it as good. They've made you seem like you're smarter and more fit if you do this. But it's not true. <laughs> At least you can't act on it. The monotasking is going to be the new thing. The single yeah. thing. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's, let's hit a third point about this that they found. Multi, multi, um, high multitaskers don't switch well between tasks. Now, that sounds counterintuitive. You think somebody that is used to doing multiple things at once would be able to switch well between tasks, but they don't. It actually, it takes time. They have to, like power down from one task and power up to the next next task. And even though that might be happening in a few short seconds, if you're constantly doing that, if you know, if you're doing that multiple times an hour, multiple times a minute, it really starts to add up. Now the second study that really digs into that part of the topic, uh, it was entitled, Why is it so hard to do my work? The challenge of attention residue when switching between work tasks. Um, and again, uh, Excellent study that came out of the Leonard Stern School of Business, New York University, and I'll we'll have a link to that below. But the, this notion of switching between tasks 
being costly. And it, if you're doing one task, there's no switching. There's no cost. Whereas if you're doing two tasks, if you switch back and forth, you're gonna you're paying a price every switch. And if you're doing three things, you're probably switching more. So you're paying more of a price. So it's costing you event by event. So and I can give you an, uh, a couple examples of that. My, a simple thing might be making dinner. If you're making dinner and it's just, you know, I'm, I'm making um, some meat and I'm making some vegetables. Okay, there's, there's two things going on there. But it's possible you will burn the steak because you're paying attention to the vegetables. That's one thing that could happen because you're doing multiple things at once. If you could do just one of those things at a time, it'd be great. You know, but hey, this isn't McDonald's where there's one guy on the, on the grill and one guy on the, on the French fryer. Right? <laughs> so you, sometimes you have to do more than one thing at a time. But you know the difference than just, hey, sitting down and make a meal and having the whole family over for, for a holiday meal and you're, you're making six different dishes. It's chaos, right? It's uncomfortable. And, you make, and sometimes you make mistakes, but certainly it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort. And it actually would go easier if, if grandma bought the pie, brought the pie and uncle brought the turkey and... <laughs> And nep nephew brought the brought the stuffing. It, it'd be a lot easier to get things done that way. In fact, if you've done things like that where everybody brings something, well, it's just assembly and go. It's it is simpler. Now, I'm not arguing here that you shouldn't make a nice family dinner sometime, uh, but I am pointing out that you can see that it, that it is a cost, and there's a reason why you don't do that every day because it's hard, and and it does. You, you, there's some benefits from it in the short run, but not on a continuous basis. On a regular basis, you, you make simpler meals because it works better. Okay, here's the fourth one, and this, one's, this one really gets me. High multitaskers don't prioritize well. Like, oh, that one just, just stabbed me to the heart. <laughs> As I thought I was really great at that because I was, I was really planned a lot, but the problem is the study observed that um, the multitasker may not realize the priorities that they're applying to their multiple tasks. For instance, uh, a favorite multitasking scenario is talking on a cell phone while driving. Now, here's the, here's the thing that's weird about that. You'd think that driving would be the primary activity, whereas the phone call would be the distraction. But what other studies have found is actually it's the opposite. The phone call is the priority and now the driving is a distraction to your phone call. Now, isn't that scary? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's hands-free, yeah? It's not... Yeah, yeah even hands-free. Because, remember, we're just talking about your mind here. We're not talking about the activity of your body. So, my attention is on my phone call, not on the 18-wheeler who's hit the brakes in front of me. Or the, the kid that's running the street. Because a lot, um, a lot of... Uh, um driving is just a kind of ingrained behavior, you know, habitual, mm -hmm. habitual. And so it's quite easy. You could see, you know, you're still holding the steering wheel. You're still doing all the stuff that you're meant to do, but it's that small, it's the, it's a more subtle cognitive shift of attention. Right. And the issue with driving isn't the, the standard driving. It's when something changes in the environment that you weren't counting on. You know, somebody, somebody runs the light or, uh, you know, uh, a child's ball rolls out into the street or somebody slams on the brakes. You know, those are the moments when you need to be fully competent and aware. And if you're just allowing your, your automatic system to turn the steering wheel and push the pedals, <laughs> you don't know what kind of outcome you're going to get. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that, well, not to get too far down this rabbit hole, but the interesting thing about that is that, um, you, you know, because you get away with it most of the time, you think it's okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I wrote it. Oh, there's been some interesting books written about that. This idea of we get we get false feedback. Well, we do something something that isn't uh, a good habit to have, and yet we get a good result, and so we use that now as proof. But uh, taking the, setting all the studies and all the research that's been done into that aside for a moment, I will refer to a Yiddish proverb, and it's very simple. It says this: "For instance, is not proof." <laughs> yeah, well, we've all done that, you know, and anecdotal data that we would like, because it, because it aligns with what we'd like to believe, 
we try to trap that out like it's like it's data. <laughs> yep, so much wisdom in that small small sentence. <laughs> yes. So just to to hit it again, here are all the here are all the bad assumptions. The, here's what happens when you're a, um, a serial multitasker. You are easily distracted. You don't use memory well. You don't switch well between tasks and you don't prioritize well. Now I realize right about now, you're reeling. It's like, ah, oh, that's just, that just doesn't describe me. I'm, I'm not like that. Well, I hate to break it to you folks, but you are like that. <laughs> it's what happens. Uh, and so how, how do we get out of it is the, is the question now. So if you will please come along with me for a minute and say this, before you just throw this all away and say, no, this is baloney, I refuse to believe it, let me give you an alternative, a different way to look at things, and perhaps, perhaps you will see a way that will give you as good or better results than your multitasking ways. So I'm going to present this as exploitation versus exploration. And I, I was talking to Nick about this earlier. And I, I really wanted to be careful about this because Nick is a huge proponent of exploration in the lab. And, you know, not just signing up for whatever the grant writer wants you to get for results. <laughs> so um, I, I want to be clear here. I am not I am not going to battle with Nick <laughs> on this. We're, I'm, I'm going to be talking about something very specific here. So when I talk about exploitation, what I'm talking about is when you get results, look for the opportunities in those results as opposed to seeking a certain objective. Um, <clears throat> let me see where else, where else I might want to go with that. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you want to explore rather than exploit, multitasking, even if you aren't good at it, <laughs> might feel good. It might be satisfying. If you just kind of want to go out there and see what's going on, yeah, go ahead and multitask and look under every leaf and behind every twig and, and you know, you can do that. It's just not a terribly efficient way of approaching things if you have an objective. Whereas if you've entered into something with an objective, and, and I think we could agree that even when you're doing basic research, you still have objectives. You know, there, there are things that you want to know as a result, or at least you want to know that you haven't yet got the answer. So it's still important to have some clue what it is you're shooting for, right? Um, and if that's the case, if you, are, if you are driving towards something, it is going to be easier for you to monotask. You're going to, when I say easier, I mean it's going to be easier to do the tasks, it's going to be easier to do multiple tasks because not granted you're not doing them in parallel you're doing them in series but you're getting them done and you're getting them done efficiently and you're getting and you have clarity on each one as you're as you're marching through it so having said all that nick <laughs> is there any qualification you want to give there well i'm trying to get my head around that um my take home from that is that you're saying that if you want to what, what you're calling Exploration is basically messing around, just dabbling. Right. If you want to dabble, then multitasking is great. If you want to get stuff done, exploitation, as you've called it here, then monotasking is the way to go. Um, is, that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And so, I mean, again, it doesn't clash with what I would call exploration, which is it's not so much uh, about going, you know, looking for things other than, you know, it's more about not being pathed by what you think is going to happen in the lab, uh, in, in an experiment rather. Uh, you know, it's easy for us to try and, it's the difference between trying to get a result and asking a question. Um, that's, not what we're, that's not the sort of exploration we're talking about here. You're just using that as a term for um, what, not, directly going, not directly trying to get something done, but just messing around with it, you know, uh, dabbling. Yes. And... So this may give you a little hope here. If you really, really, really love multitasking, um, it's fine. You can still multitask. Just don't do it with anything important. <laughs> it, you know, you want to go out and explore the woods? Go ahead. 
it'll be great. Take some time for that, and and satisfy that 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 need in your soul. But when you're back at work, when you're back in the lab, it's time to monotask. I mean, what what is really striking me here is the um, is the extreme downside, the extreme damage that multitasking does to your uh, your efficiency. Mm-hmm. So it's not a benign thing. It's actively destroying those um, those uh, according to that this study anyway that you've mentioned or these studies. It's actually breaking down the fabric of your ability to to get things done. Right. Which is really serious, actually. And so exactly. then, and so then we should be looking at the way that we um, that we do things to to take ourselves back from it. So and from doing that for me. Um, when I was in the lab, I was, as you said, very up on big on multitasking, making sure that every minute counted. And <laughs> count, by counting, I meant that every minute I was doing something that was moving me towards the goal that I wanted to get to, to get the experiments finished or get these three experiments finished, set up today or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that, that strikes me that I used to do was to, for example, um, set up two experiments in parallel. So I've got two experiments to set up. Um, there are some incubation steps of five minutes or a few minutes or whatever in, in protocol one. And so I try to start protocol two in between those steps just to get a jump start. There's obviously a fine line. You don't want to, you know, if there's, if there's hour-long steps between, um, you know, incubations or gaps in the protocol, then it's, you know, that's probably a fine to start the next um, experiment, but if it's short switches like within minutes, then that's probably something you want to stay away with, stay away from rather. Um, yeah. Probably the mark for me, the, the sort of uh, determine what, what would determine whether I should be doing the other, the, the set, saying that the second experiment at the same time, looking back on it now, the determinant would be whether it's still peaceful to do the next one, whether it's still calm, or do I feel harassed? By doing the next one because it seems to me as well it's like if it's okay playing is is okay for multitasking is okay for play but as soon as you do it for work and there's pressure then that's going that's surely going to make this whole breakdown of the fabric of your um yes yeah, sooner sooner or later it's going to blow up in your face and and that's that's the problem now i realize that some of you are thinking back to my yiddish proverb you're thinking well but for instance <laughs> You know, Nikola Tesla, all he did was multitask all day long. Well, yes, that was that's true. And honestly, he wasn't a very happy individual. <laughs> now, if you are bent on really being a, you know, change the world, stand out um, in mankind person, and you want to defy this, I'm not going to stand in your way. But for most of us, even those of us who do want to make a difference in the world, it's more important that I be good at my job, efficient at my work, focused at all times. I will do better work than this moonshot kind of stuff. <laughs> um, not arguing against moonshots, just saying everybody shouldn't be doing moonshots. So know, know where you are, know what you're, what you're willing to commit to. If you are willing to take, the, take that chance, Go ahead, but understand a lot of people. There are a lot of people that were just like Nikola Tesla you've never heard of, because they never made it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, decide decide for yourself. Choose for yourself what you're going to be. But for most of us, it's going to be you know I'd, I'd rather be efficient uh, rather than harried. Yeah, I, I mean for me as well. One rule of thumb was for me about, and, and I guess that's probably what made me harried. <laughs> um, was that I would try not to leave any gaps. So I would always be trying to do something, as I said. And so that would be, I mean, I've got, I think I'm pretty sure I've got articles on Bite Size Bio talking about uh, when you have a five minute step, like a centrifugation or something, what you can do in that time. <laughs> it's like read a paper. You know, you've got five minutes gap. You could read a paper. You could clear up this. You could do, you know, actually, it's probably just as useful to or actually important to just allow that time to just just let your you know right you could you could do something important but not urgent 
<laughs> well, you can do something important like let your mind wander and just let you, you know, you let yourself connect up some dots, you know. Exactly. Um, rather than forcing yourself to keep going down these lines all the time of, of to-do lists, you know, g- give yourself some air to breathe. Um, I, I, I suspect, I don't know if that, that's part of the study, but, uh, or there are other ones like that, but I suspect that if you look at monotasking versus multitasking, then uh, it's going to be more productive to do the monotasking, but also people will be happier. Yes. Yeah, that, this study talked more about that. The, other, the, the second study just talked about the practical concerns about how you just lose ground every time you switch tasks, but, uh, but it very, very convincingly does so. So I want to I point out something interesting here. Nick has, a, has distinguished himself in the world. Brightside Bio is a known entity. Uh, people know about it. I can't tell you many times I've, I've talked to people who are scientists and said, oh, bite size, wow, yeah, I would have never got through my PhD without it. And, and that's great. I will tell you, Nick also happens to be an expert on cloning and slime molds. But you probably don't know his name associated with that. Why? <laughs> well, because, because this, this is what's happening here. He, he was multitasking back in the day, and it wasn't getting him that, that fame in his field, right? When, when, he, got, when he, he switched over to doing something where he was more, more uh, monofocused, more is getting done. And therefore, more, more uh, accolades come his way, more fame comes his way, more success comes his way. And it's, it's going to be true for you, too. <laughs> and we and and he had such hopes for it too that's the, see this is the other thing whatever you're working on right now i know you believe it's important <laughs> right <laughs> whether or not the world will agree with you remains to be seen <laughs> so if you are going along and you're getting things done in an orderly fashion you will find that your career and your opportunities will be on an upward climb there will, it will be an upward spiral. What you're doing right now, maybe five steps away from the thing that really catapults you to the top of your field or to whatever it is you're trying to personally achieve in your career. And you can't even see that five steps away yet. You don't know what it's going to be. But you want to do good work now that will take you to the next step. You know, if right now all you're doing is cleaning test tubes in the, in the lab because you're you're the low man on the totem pole, fine. <laughs> but one day, your skill and speed and quality in test tube cleaning is going to lead to you doing other things. And you know, it, it's it's always good to look at what you're doing now and say, how can I do this the best I can? Now, I noticed I've uh, I've commented on efficiency several times in here, and I don't. And we'll talk about efficiency on an, on another another broadcast, but. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying efficiency is the final goal. It's a worthy goal. It's part of the picture. But as Nick mentioned earlier, sometimes just being able to stop and ponder for a moment and wonder and think about some things and and contemplate is highly, highly valuable. It's inefficient and worth it. (laughs) Or the other way around, harassing yourself all day is not fun and it doesn't really get much. But that's what you tend to, in my experience of multitasking, that's what, that's what it was. You were, it was like you were your own, I was my own worst boss. Sure. Trying to make myself get, get more done, get more done, get more done. And yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> so at the beginning of this, I commented that some people feel, and I felt, I felt I was a good multitasker. Nick felt he was a good multitasker. Why? Because we believed we were special in some certain way. So I, I want to look at what this study said about the varying special groups you might find yourself to be in and think, well, this doesn't apply because I'm X. So listen to this list, and it's brutal. The study found no significant deviation in results based on agreeableness, conscientiousness, Creativity, extroversion, intelligence, 
neuroticism, openness, or the big one, gender. That's right, men and women are equally bad at multitasking. I know that hurts, hey? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we've noticed that being smart doesn't help. Being well-adjusted doesn't help. You know, we're just running out of excuses for this. Now, how about this? Maybe it's a generational thing. Because, you know, well, you know, these kids these days, right? <laughs> well, it's just not. Uh, while there's an enormous desire among the, you know, the Gen Yers, the Gen Xers, the teenagers, the 20-somethings to attempt to multitask, they're no better at it than the baby boomers. Motivation doesn't improve results. Peer pressure doesn't improve results. Now, it may be true that the younger crowd may work their smartphone better. However, when it comes to actual results, technological superiority doesn't make up for the fact that our brains operate basically the same way, whether we're 25 or 55. And yes, I know there are some neuroscientists out there say, yeah, there's lots of differences, but I'm talking about functional difference when it comes to multitasking, there's no difference. <laughs> so, we've already talked about some of the things you might do about this. And uh, I like to think, let's join Multitaskers Anonymous. So you are a recovering multitasker. What are you supposed to do? Well, the first thing you do is you plan for monotasking. So it's like what Nick was describing. If you had multiple experiments to set up, well, think about what's the order these things should be done. And when, when are the, there are going to be sufficient gaps to start, say, the second experiment? And so you look at how you can get multiple plates spinning, but you're really not, you're not spinning those plates. You get a plate spinning and you leave it, you go to the next plate. And you get that one spinning. And, and you focus from there. Another thing you can do is close down your input sources. Um, and I'll, I will use the example of online, and we've all done this. You know, you look at your browser, and there's 12 tabs open, and you know there's Facebook, and there's Twitter, and there's LinkedIn, and there's 12 other web pages that you're going to get to. And at the same time, you're you're surfing the web, and you're watching TV, and you're listening to the podcast, and you know, <laughs> I, stop it. Just start to shut down the input sources. Which input sources are needed right now, and all the rest, let them go. Now, um, and you know, we all have our little tricks for doing stuff like that. Because I mean, I realize you may get like, I've got this open so I don't forget about it. You know, all right, that's fine. So most browsers, for instance, will allow you to open multiple windows. Open a separate window for that one and drag it over there. And on the window that is in the front that you're looking at, only have open those, those tabs you need open for what you're doing right now. You know, the others are still there. They're, they're not going away. They haven't been lost. You're fine. And you can do that same thing. I mean, it's, it's like uh, it, you don't have to be very old to remember when there was a time when there was no such thing as a DVR. And in fact, it was such a big deal to have a VCR and it was expensive because you had to use tapes. And, but we, we were willing to spend the money because it changed the game. So... You know, make use of the technology that's available to you. Get good at the technology that is useful for you. And, you know, again, watch it about wasting your time getting good at technology that is just entertaining to you, but not particularly useful. <laughs> um, not that you shouldn't be entertained some of the time, but uh, there's, there's a point here where we spend so much time looking around and looking around and looking around that we don't get anything done. And, and that is another, that's another, uh, implementation of multitasking that we're surfing the web while we're supposed to be writing a paper you know <laughs> that's interesting because what was just crossing my mind there is that surely another well, personal experience another um symptom another consequence of of getting into the habit of multitasking is underestimating the time that it takes to do that it really takes to do something mm -hmm. and so you tie, you then you tend to cr try and cram. Either you try, try to cram things into too, too small a time period or you procrastinate and then try and cram them all in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In each case, you're setting yourself up for a stressful time and a less, a less productive time as well. So 
getting used to that, I, you know, getting used to the idea that, or, of, or exploring the idea that you're underestimating the time it takes to do something. You've got three experiments to take up. Maybe that's going to take you all day to do it, and you can't get it all done in the morning. But by going more slowly, going more methodically, then you get, you're more likely to get them right the first time rather than, than messing one or two of them up and having to do them again the next day. That's right. But I was, there was a book I read back in the 80s um, by someone named Mark McCormack that was entitled What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. And one of the things that he said is, you know about how long it takes to do things when you plan your day, so plan accordingly. And I, that one just cut me to the heart because I realized I didn't know how long it took me to do things. I hadn't bothered to really pay attention to how long it took me to do things. And thus, I was, I was never getting everything done I wanted to get done. And when I finally faced the truth of that, that was knowable information. Well, <laughs> I changed my behavior. But, you know, that, golly, that was a long time ago, man. <laughs> Almost 35 years. But, you know, truth is truth. If, 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 it's, good, if it's good information, it's useful, uh, let's put it to use. So, at the end of the day, the less you multitask, the more you will accomplish. And I'm certain that you care more about accomplishing than multitasking. So let's focus on that, because accomplishment can become habit forming. So is there anything else you want to add today, Nick? No, I think that was another tour de force there, I, I, um, right, to the, right to the heart of what is going on for a lot of people, not just in the lab, but um, in the modern day workplace. You have so many inputs that it's just so tempting to try and, uh, to try and cram all of this in. Yeah, time indeed. seems shorter, so it's so tempted to cram all of it in. But I think the, I mean, again, it, it, these all of these episodes, the, the, you know, things that we're touching on, they kind of cross over each other. This is also about, you know, the flip side of this, the art of going slow, which we mm -hmm. talked about previously. You know, it's that sort of idea of just giving yourself the time to accept the, the space and the focus to excel at what you're doing rather than trying just to, you're not a factory. So you can't just churn stuff out. And right. And, and we, the, the, the regular people of mankind, we need you to excel at what you do. <laughs> Please do. We really, want, we really need you to do it. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a, that's a wrap for today. That's a, yep. enough for people to think about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think uh, before we head off... Um, just a reminder that you can join us if you enjoyed this episode and you want more of the same. Uh, then obviously you can find other episodes at bitesizebio.com forward slash the happy scientist. But uh, you can also get more, um, you know, more variety of uh, ways to focus on this, uh, on these topics at facebook.com forward slash the happy scientist club. And we'll see you in there. Yeah, and please, if you've something you want to hear about, you want us to talk about, mention it there, and, and we'll reply to you. Yeah, tell us what's bothering you. <laughs> Ken can sort it out for you. <laughs> All right. Do what I can. <laughs> thanks again, Ken, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you Thank again you. later. Scientist is brought to you by Bite Size Bio, your mentor in the lab. Bite Size Bio features thousands of articles and webinars contributed by hundreds of PhD scientists and scientific companies who freely offer their hard-won wisdom and solutions to the Bite Size Bio community.